Welcome to the Bioptimizer's awesome health podcast. And now here's your host, Wade T. Lightheart. What if you could double your energy naturally without caffeine or stimulants in just three short months? It's not only possible, you can transform every aspect of your health if you follow the 12-week blueprint we've created for you in the Awesome Health System. The Awesome Health System is a free course where you receive a daily video lesson spanning the most cutting-edge secrets for air, water, exercise, sunshine, optimizers, mindset, and education. It's something most companies would charge hundreds of dollars for, yet you get it for free when you go to buyoptimizers.com. To access your course, register to download the PDF report called Three Phases of Bioptimization, which gets you access to the report and daily access to the first lesson in the 12-week, 84-day Awesome Health course. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Wade T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today's guest is Mike Feldstein. He is the founder of Jasper. A seasoned air quality expert and entrepreneur, he leveraged his experience in wildfire restoration and air quality consulting to found Jasper, a premium air purifier company to innovate in air science and technology. His purpose is to protect air quality and boost human health using the latest air quality science and tech. So we're going to learn a lot today about air quality, what you need to look at in regards to a filter, what to be concerned about, as well as the things that you need to be looking for inside your air quality. And of course, if you are in a compromised situation, as many people are, and of course, Mike has got a lot of on the ground experience in areas that people might be compromised there, like wildfires, things like that. So, hey, Mike. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, man. So I know we had a really great chat before we started. We said we should have recorded it. It was all about Canada, why you moved to the States, entrepreneurship. And then, of course, more importantly, the service that you're providing to people around air quality. And on by optimizers for our listeners, and they all know this, is that I created uh, an 84-day course. And it was based on an acronym acronym that I talk about health. And the acronym is AWESOME, which stands for Air, Water, Exercise, Sunlight, Optimizers, Mental Beliefs and Attitude, Education, Testing, and Coaching as the methodology of approaching your health. But the first thing that you've got to deal with is air. And I always say, well, people worry about diets all the time. We're famous for being diet experts. We've got a new book on it, The Ultimate Nutrition Bible. We talk about how to be successful in all diets. But and then I look at... Well, but you can go a long time without food, month or so. You can go maybe a week or so without water. Sucks, but, you know, certainly a few days, depending on the environment. But you can only go minutes without air. But so many people are worried about diet. They don't think about water and they don't think about air because they're almost like un- so, so pervasive. It's like the fish doesn't know he's in the ocean. So... Tell me about how you got involved in air quality and why that's so important to you and why you founded a business around providing premium air quality service to people. So, yeah, I saw a really good YouTube video uh, last week that um, it had a goldfish bowl with three goldfish in it. And this older goldfish swims by the two young goldfish. And he's like, hey, boys, how's the water? And then the two goldfish say, what's water? And you're like, whoa, like, really, what's air? And, and and until we had science and stuff to kind of measure it and test it and things like that and, and teach about it a little bit, we would have had no idea what air even is. Because we live, it's in us and we're in it. We just are in air. It's not separate from us. Um, so I think for this reason, like, you know, you're hungry, you go get food, you're thirsty, you go get water. Uh, like, you, you know, you talked about how long you can survive without each, but I feel like because, you know, you could have a coma or go to sleep at night, you know, you need machines to like get food and water, but your body breathes without you even being conscious. 
Yes, it's one of the few things that you can do both consciously and unconsciously. So if you don't think about it, you breathe on your own, or you can go through all these breathing practices that elicit different states. And I think for our listeners to just, this is a concept that hit me the other day as I was researching this particular area about oxygenization and mitochondrial function and, you know, hydration and the impact of all these things. And I was like, well, from a certain point of view, we're actually living in an ocean of air. So the density of water molecules or molecules is different than say you would have in an ocean situation. So if you think of, we had these bacteria, uh, I was doing this from an evolutionary standpoint. We had these, you know, bacterias that used to live on vents. There was some breaking of uh, thermic vents in the ocean. And then there was a break where they could create energy systems outside of itself. And then mitochondria or bacteria fused with these cells and that gave us mobility areas that we didn't have to be around a heat source and then plants went in one direction we went kind of in this other direction uh and and then you know the animals emerged out of the ocean onto the land and somehow they started bridging this gap you have the amphibious creatures and then you have the air creatures and then i saw that you have creatures that were breathing on the land that went back into the ocean and became whales <laughs> and so it's like oh okay so the, this we're not in a static situation, but I think it's safe to say that the quality of your air probably impacts your health far more than people know. I know I had a mold expert on the other day. He said over half the homes in America have mold exposure. Oh yeah, and mold is really bad for you. Sure can be. Uh, I've experienced the same thing. You know, my background was in air quality consulting so, and, and remediation, mold, fires, flood, that kind of stuff. In like Toronto, for example, I would say 90 plus percent of homes have mold. In these wow. humid places that have cold winters and pretty warm summers where the homes, it's a lot of silly stuff. Like oftentimes the bathroom vents, people think that bathroom fans are for poop smell. They're not. They're for humidity. And typically they're just venting right into the attic. And then the attic itself has no ventilation. So you're just venting moisture into this confined space. You get mold in the attic, you get mold in the insulation. So if you include attics, almost every house in Toronto, let's say, has mold. If you go out to like Montana and Calgary, where it's more Alberta, it's more dry, that mold percentage comes way down. If you go to Florida, it's way up. So where there's like places that have humidity throughout the year um, and then places that get cold and have a lot of insulation, like almost everywhere has mold. Uh, it's very difficult to navigate unless you're like building a, a, a house from scratch it's quite a difficult thing to navigate um so i'll go back to what you asked how did i get into it i got into it by being in the i got first into the restoration industry so mold cleanup hazardous environment cleanup floods fires uh hurricanes things of that nature so if california was on fire or alberta was on fire or had a flood we would mobilize a team and clean, fix, restore, and rebuild homes after natural disasters. So we weren't your like local basement leak, call us restoration company. We would only do catastrophes and natural disasters. So we were mobile and responsive and kind of wait for the disaster to hit, pick up the red phone and mobilize, hire locally and get involved with insurance. So we would only do catastrophes. And I got to see how bad the, you know, so... Fort McMurray, Alberta was the most, yep. that was really the the big turning point for me. That was my last major event where I went to because I got to see people got evacuated. A hundred thousand people got evacuated. The whole city got evacuated for a month. We went back in there. We would measure and test all the air. It was off the charts, toxic. It wasn't just the tree smoke, but when the 3000 homes burnt, every car, every chemical, every WD-40, every paint, it was this perfect blend of a toxic soup that you were breathing. It was it was spicy. It was a little hard to breathe. So we would clean these homes and there was no precedent for how to even clean smoke damage like this. This was off the charts, regionalized smoke damage. It wasn't like a kitchen fire. This was a uh, smoke damage, not fire damage. So there wasn't really a good prescription for it. And the scope of work kept increasing to eventually it was... Every carpet, every couch, furniture, clothing, porous material, insulation, even repainting the whole house to seal it. And we basically like took it all out, encapsulated it. And then we would test the air 
And then we would give a green light for the families to move back in the house and say, hey, it's safe, it's clean. Well, one family moved back in, then we got a call a week later, baby's in the hospital. What do you mean? We go back, we test the air quality. And the air was indeed heavily toxic, heavily polluted. And we're like, what the heck? We tested it. We cleared it. It was fine. Well, after a really bad fire, the air quality can stay bad for months in the valley. So we clean the indoor air. And then where does the air come from? Outside. So the house got recontaminated. Baby's sick on a nebulizer. Can't be home. I call the insurance company. I'm like, hey, guys, what should we do? I think this family should go back to Edmonton or Calgary they need a hotel or another city. Let's wait a month, re-clean it, and then bring them back. And they basically said, nope, so sad, too bad. Um, they said, we're paying you. They signed off. Like, our work here is done. I'm like, whoa, we just made all this money, and we accomplished nothing. So I brought our big, giant air scrubbers. So imagine an air purifier the size of a, a subwoofer or a photocopier. Loud, ugly, industrial, but effective. So this is your tractor trailer, not your SUV. And we would leave, we left a few in their house. And within a couple hours, the air quality was good again. So I said, Hey, Tanya, that was the, the mom's name. I said, we're just going to leave these machines here. We'll retest in a few weeks. And when the house is, the air is staying stable, we will um, take them and we'll, we'll all be good. Well, this kept happening. And I'm like, we can't just leave all of our equipment out there. So I went to like Best Buy or Home Depot or Canadian Tire. And I bought a bunch of little air purifiers, two to $500 machines. I bought like five of them, put them back in the house. I'm like, it's better for you just to keep these than me to leave like my industrial stuff here. Anyway, we test the air again in a few hours and it's completely contaminated. We're like, what the heck? These little things aren't doing anything. So the analogy I now use is these little air purifiers that you see for a couple hundred dollars on Amazon or Best Buy. It's think about a kettle trying to heat a bathtub. Kettles are great for heating water for tea. But if you try to fill your bath with the kettle, the water is going to cool far faster than you can heat it. You can never fill your bathtub with a kettle. You can never heat your, your swimming pool with a water heater. We need a different size water heater to match. You can't heat your house with a space heater. You can heat a closet, maybe a small bedroom. You would need like a space heater in every single room to heat your house. So I really got to see how ineffective these little things were. And our machine was super effective, but it was loud and it was ugly. And I remember one lady named Angela, she unplugged it. I'm like, Angela, what are you doing? Your kids are here. Your babies are here. Your air is horrible. He's like, I know, I know, I know. But it's so loud and it's so ugly. I can't keep this thing in my living room. Like I run it when I leave. And all of that experience combined with that problem I saw. And I, I had since moved to British Columbia and I got to see... Those 50 days per year when they say air quality alert, stay inside. Well, I measured that stay inside air and it was only 30% cleaner, 20% cleaner than the outdoor air. It was like the campfire effect. You don't smell like smoke at the campfire when you come inside and take a shower, then you realize you stink. So mm -hmm. it's, it's nose blind. It's relative. So when you come inside from the campfire, the wildfire smoke, it seems okay inside. It's not okay. It's not okay at all. And I realized, whoa. No one's going to, we really, I was in the reactive business with wildfires, but I saw air, wildfires are getting worse. Pollutions are getting worse. Across the board, the air quality is getting worse and the innovation of air purification is not getting better. So I felt like we had these, we, we had like, we had golf carts and we had pickup trucks or 18 wheelers. So it's like impractical, large industrial or like cute and cheap and small and ineffective, these two opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but like, where are the minivans at? Where Where's the Yukon Denali at? Where's the luxury SUV where I can take my kids and my stuff, be safe and look good while doing it? And I realized just as a consumer, I'm like, I want that. Um, I got to see with mold, fire, flood, sometimes you see, need a certain amount of size to get the job done. You can't mm -hmm. pull your boat with a Honda Civic. Um, it's efficient. It's cheap. It uses a little bit of gas. So I, I just kind of, by being in the wildfire flood mold game, seeing how bad the air was. And lastly, when we would test the air after there were standards for what air is good enough for the family to move back home. What's a pass. And it really reminded me to like the medical system where it's like, you get a blood test or like, we'll call you if you're dying and you get these blood tests. And it's like, 
-hmm. if they don't they could call you could be doing horrible and they don't call you like good is not good enough when it comes to health in my opinion mm -hmm. i want excellent i want optimal so the same way that doctors aren't trained on nutrition uh hvac home builders architects home inspectors they're not taught about air quality so i just saw this huge gap in awareness and solutions and i basically spent a couple years traveling to the worst air places in the world bangkok kuala and Bumpur, Beijing, and I got to see how bad the air was, but how good the air purifiers were and how common. They had air purifier stores in the mall. When I would go to the bank, they had one in every single room. Restaurants had them. The air, the air was worse, but the air awareness was much greater. Mm. So I'm just like, okay, we, we, we need the luxury SUV of air. So I spent a few years on this journey, learning more and more and more about air and tinkering and trying to find the most effective, affordable, practical way to bring clean air into people's homes without it being an annoying eyesore. So that's kind of the five minute summary of how we got from there to here. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great uh, illustration. And, you know, one of the things that um, I have found, just kind of a, pre, pre, it's kind of a, an extension of our earlier conversation is regulatory oversight that often has unintended uh effects one of those things that you see happening now is energy efficient homes and i and to talk about this my dad who's worked as a carpenter and he's worked as a laborer he's worked as a plumber he's worked as an electrician he's worked as a, a, a all these different areas and he talks about home design as it used to be and he talks about exactly what you were referring to in that so you know we got to have breathing in the how the house has to breathe and it has to have a certain amount but you see these regulatory of these green initiatives that are creating these hyper super efficient energy homes for the reduction of energy but there's some people who are saying there's problems on the air quality or the unintended consequences consequence of meeting a regulation on this part has a suboptimal stuff and the great thomas soul the american philosopher who i just absolutely love his stuff he says one thing in life that you'll find is there are no solutions there's trade-offs <laughs> so are is as as someone who's been intimately involved in this have you noticed there is potential overlap problems between be creating energy efficient homes versus that's air quality <laughs> homes, high high yes. quality air or high quality living homes. Yes, this is awesome. This is the best stuff ever. Um, and I'll start by just setting the tone for all this kind of stuff to say. Um, often when things aren't good, um, I, I've becoming more and more and more on the tone of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yes. More where I used to go down the path of five dudes in a boardroom conspiring. Right. To yeah. Yeah. Space. Um, yeah. Energy efficiency. How can we not agree that use burning less fossil fuels, keeping the warm in in the winter, the cool in there in the summer is not a great thing. Um, and like, I don't think the folks who were creating the educational systems for HVAC and architects and home builders were like, let's make these cancer box homes. No, but you know, the profitability drove, optimized for speed and consistency and low variance. So we cut all the trees down. So there's no variance and we, we build as quickly as we can. But the beautiful thing about honestly, all this air stuff is I really feel like with a lot of stuff, like if we look at food, it's like there's such huge corporations with such financial motivations or pharmaceuticals to keep things the way they are. And I actually believe, believe with the healthy home environment stuff, it's this one area where I actually think everybody will win by doing a better job. Um, so it's very exciting. I don't feel like I'm in this area with this like massive upstairs battle where, you know, uh, supplements are like the enemy of uh, pharma and exercise right. is the enemy of drugging meds, whatever. So I, I, it really excites me to have this like air, area that I think actually just some of this education makes it better for everybody. So it's mostly systematic, these problems. Um, and like you said, so let's tackle it right head on. Energy efficiency is massively at odds with environmental efficacy and effectiveness because 
Um, the best air purifier in the world is trees, it's water, it's wind, it's sun. The best UV light of all is the sun. The best hydroxyl radicals and filtration is the wind. There's no dust outside. Dust is an indoor problem. And our, in, our we get sick inside because we left nature outside. And then you're like, if we brought, brought it inside, we have these new problems. We're cold, we're hot. It's mostly comfort issues. It's mostly comfort stuff, but it could be the bug bite. It could be the animal intruder. It could be home invasions. You know, having a, a tight, secure shell to sleep in, to cook in, to live in. It's nice. I like it. Um, there's trade-offs, but there's yeah, trade-offs to that. It's a trade-off entirely. Uh, now, with awareness, if you are building a home from scratch, you actually can have the best of all the worlds without even having the money trade off. Like, it, you know, we trade off, we trade off, we trade off. And then sometimes there really is the optimal configuration. But with homes, you know, we have all these codes of bylaws and codes about the environmental efficiency. So basically, it's like sealing everything in is really what it's saying. If why every hotel, people joke that in Vegas, there's no balconies on the hotel so people don't jump off. That's not why. That's what insurance is for. There's no windows that open in hotels because if they let people open the windows, they would open the windows and the heating and cooling bill would be 5X. That would be a big problem for that building. Then their hotel price would be a lot higher and nobody would stay there. So like to keep a controlled environment, we want to decrease the variables. So when you, your indoor air is always coming from outside. So it needs to get in. Typically in a home, it's coming from your doors, your windows, your dryer vent, your dishwasher vent. It's leaking in. There's not a centralized place to bring it in. So what happens is when you do have a super dialed in energy efficient home, well, you have outdoor pollution and you have indoor pollution. Those are like the two big buckets that everything fits under. Outdoor pollution is allergens, pollen, mold, your cedar fever, your hay fever, it's the it's the wildfire smoke, it's the smog, it's the car exhaust, it's the insect parts, it's the um it's the neighbor across the street whose contractor is cutting two by fours. If wildfire smoke from 3,000 miles away gets in your house, when the neighbor's doing a renovation or putting the little lint sheet in the dryer, that's getting in your house too. When I open my door just quickly to go inside and my barbecue is about 50, 60 feet away from the back door, my jaspers turn red and they go crazy. Because air is much like water. If you put a bunch of food coloring drops in the water, it doesn't stay there. It spreads. Put a few drops of food coloring in even a bathtub. It doesn't take long for that whole bathtub to be a little bit red. So it's get that water. Those, those water currents move just like air currents. So if we trap all the air in. So now we have those outdoor pollutants that come in. But then we've lost the sun. We've lost the wind. We've lost all the natural purification properties that we have in the environment. And then we have our indoor pollutions. So we have cooking, cleaning, personal care, hairspray, shampoo, soaps, dogs and cats, dog and cat food, cat litter. We've talked about cleaning products. We have off-gassing from paints, from furniture, from clothing. When a, when a piece of furniture gets built or a home gets built, the ideal situation for the factory, for the manufacturer, for the distributor is make the stuff, seal the stuff, ship the stuff, they want to go from production to sold as quick as possible. So really, optimally, an, a house and furniture and everything would have about a year to off-gas and breathe before you would have it in your house. So if someone does have the opportunity when they buy some furniture to put it in the garage or put it outside, let stuff breathe before they bring it in the home. That's always a huge win. So we have this house. It's a Tupperware container wrapped in saran wrap, basically. Vapor barriers. And then we have outdoor pollutions that come in. We trap them in. We have indoor pollutions that stay in. Most homes have far more pollen inside than outside. So you think of seasonal allergies as an outdoor problem. Why do you think if you spend 95% of your time indoors, you're still heavily impacted by seasonal allergies? It's inside. It's in your blankets. It's in your sheets. It's anything porous. Anything that can absorb water can absorb air. So all those pollutants get trapped in your house. And then you crack a window to let fresh air in and breathe. Well, then you're cold, you're hot, your heating bills goes up. And that outdoor air is often also polluted now in a city environment. So the clean air, fresh air outside is not that fresh anyway. So basically the reason that environmental um, uh, efficiency is at odds with the health of the environment is because we basically just create a little bubble that keeps nature outside. 
and traps everything inside. Funny you should say that. My grandmother, who lived to be uh, in her late 90s, and my grandfather, is every morning they open, she started her day by opening up the windows. She said, we got to get rid of the old air and put in the fresh. Like, she's like, there was like this, you know, she, she, and they, they always were very clear that they had to change the air in their house. Now, they weren't very sophisticated in filters and stuff, but somehow they innately knew that air quality was something that was really important. The question I have is, um, I guess, you talked about, you touched on air quality, you touched about cooking, barbecues in particular. What is, there's now new regulations they're trying to put in, no, no gas cooking, and then we have magnetic cooking, we have propane, we have gas, we have heating elements. We've got burnt food on your inside your 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 uh, ovens, and you know your. And then we've got cleaning agents. Yes, you know some of the things that people clean the agent ovens with. I'm like, holy, that that can't be good for you. <laughs> you know, so this whole aspect of, of of cooking and its impact on air quality. Maybe you want to touch on that for a second because yeah, I think that's the biggest one. It is. It really. That's the is that why thing. they put these big vents over top of cooking things and stuff? So, yeah. So typically, range hoods are supposed to be like three to four feet above where we cook. But for aesthetic purposes, we install them way higher to the point where they're not effective at all. Um, if I could in invent everything all at once, my next product would be a range hood with a sensor. Wow. Why do you manually turn your range hood on and off? It's a fifty dollars sensor that can sit in there. And it should be able to detect humidity, carbon dioxide, and particulate from cooking. You should not need an air purifier in the main area of your house. You already have this massive fan that should be the air purifier. It's not. It's silly. It's so silly. Um, cooking's a big deal. Because if you think about it, so you, you touched on a bunch of good stuff. People think about using it just like bacon, set it on high, get the smoke out. When I use a cast iron pan or a steel stainless steel pan with olive oil and asparagus, my particulates go through the roof. So wow. I, yeah, vegetables with clean, fancy, expensive olive oil and a and a clean stainless steel pan and a even then my particulate goes crazy. Well, PAH, which is polysilic aromatic hydrocarbons, is the number one one of the top things we would test for after wildfire smoke. It's very cancer causing. When you have especially fats and proteins at heat, like if you think about, you know, you have water, it's a liquid. If you freeze it, it's a solid. If you humidify it or you heat it up, it's a gas. So if, if water aerosolizes, pretty much everything has a air. When you cook, why do you smell the food? You're not putting it in your nose. It's because you're aerosolizing the particles of the food at extreme heat. So new compounds are formed, which aren't necessarily great for you to breathe. So, and remember, anything porous that can absorb water can absorb smoke. So when you start cooking, whether it's your pets, your body hair, your bed, your drywall, the, the, the unsurfaced, um, the unfinished MDF under your dining table, everything is absorbing these, these compounds. PAH is a really, really big one. Um, then you have, if you're using nonstick pans, the pan itself, like if nonstick pans are bad, because there's a, why is nonstick pan bad? Well, those coatings aren't great for you just because if, if they can absorb it to your food, what do you think happens at super high heat? You don't think it goes into the air. Um, then, of course, you have the carbon monoxide from the stove itself, which I had a very close call on this week. UJ, who you said hi to before, he was making tea and he turned the, the stove the wrong way. Enough where the flame was off, but the gas was still leaking. My wife, oh. Rachel, woke up 6 a.m. The house stunk like gas. Luckily, I have five Jaspers at home. So our airflow is good and the carbon is helpful with carbon monoxide and it was on a low setting, but wow, we all could have never woken up. So I'm actually, I think gas stoves should have a timer on them at the very least, like a couple basic safety or a big red light that says on, you know, there's the, the red light if they're hot, there should be a yeah. red light if gas is coming off or a timer. I think that would be a good idea. Or an alarm or something like that saying, you know, Hey, like, like a door alarm, you know, Hey, well you get your, you got a gas leak here. Yeah, don't rely on these little $20 Walmart carbon monoxide detectors that nobody remembers to change. Um, <laughs> right. So basically, yeah, cooking is probably the biggest. Like, when did we even invent cooking indoors? Never mind indoors 
period. It was roof over your head, some walls. And then somehow we got to these really tight containers quite recently. And now we cook in that. So we have this little tight box, which is already bad. And then we have high heat gas stoves with raw foods and proteins and all the chemicals that they spray your food with. And we put it under extreme heat and we boil it. And rain shuds are quite ineffective. Little pro tip, if you are boiling stuff, use the back range hood, not the front one. A lot more will get captured. And if weather permits, when you're cooking, open your windows if you can. Like when you smell a strong odor of cooking in your house, this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing because that air is not all just getting out. You don't want all of that. You smell the nice pasta, the nice smell, but it's all the stuff. you only, Our little noses can only detect the tip of the iceberg. Even mm. with wildfire smoke, we think we see and smell smoke. We're seeing 1%. It's, it's there days before we see it, and it's there days after we see it. And the same thing with a cat litter. I've set up air quality sensors all over a house, 4,000 square foot house, basement. That's just the main floor and upstore. So with the basement, we have a 6,000 square foot house that I'm talking about. Cat litters in the basement, in the storage room. Kitty uses a litter box. <laughs> Within about two minutes, every bedroom in the house has air quality off the charts because that dusting, clumping, odor-free litter is filled with chemicals. Just go look what's in it. Kitty uses the litter box. That gets aerosolized. Is aerosolized. It goes in your return vent. Then your HVAC system mixes that across the whole house. Your HVAC system is the lungs of your home. And that little filter in the HVAC system, it's not designed to filter it's designed to keep the HVAC system safe and clean. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, rapid cheat meal relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on Masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot com and enter the code CHEAT10 at checkout. It reminds me of, uh, I remember finding out years ago how the use of scented aerosol cans is actually includes like mustard gas to disable your nasal system. It doesn't actually deal with the chemicals. And it's like, oh, if I don't notice, it's no big deal. And you've kind of elicited a variety of areas that are plumbing. What are the side effects physically that people experience if they're in a suboptimal uh, air quality environment? So with a little small shift, you'll actually know more about it than me, believe it or not, because what I've learned a lot about is it's pretty much like I have this psoriasis that I'm vastly improving. I cut out bread for my diet a couple weeks ago, but if I have polluted air, it gets horrible. If I drink unfiltered water or shower or bathe in it, and if I eat a non, an unclean diet, this is this beautiful in the check engine light for me saying you're you're getting in a bad environment son you're eating bad food you're making bad choices and pretty much all the same like if you eat the big mac every day and deep fried food and fake veggie meats and whatever in that nutrition bible if you do the opposite you won't die tonight yeah if you drink heavily chlorinated tap water possibly even pond water that will give you parasites and bacteria you got a robust little machine here you won't die tonight but you might be tired, you might sleep poor, you might focus less, you might have a worse immune system, you get might get more sick. So like the same stuff that's going to harm you with unfiltered water or unclean suboptimal food is the same kind of vibe as air. So autoimmune gets worse, asthma attacks get worse, respiratory conditions get worse, sleep gets just destroyed. I have a friend whose aura ring, sleep score, he put the Jasper in his bedroom, his baseline sleep score in Toronto was a 61 and then it was instantly up to a 91 because he had some he had mold in his apartment. 
So it's not about what is air doing to you. It's just like, it's not like what is food doing to you? It's too broad. So it's mm -hmm. like, what is mold doing to you? Are you allergic to that species of mold? What is pollen doing to you? Are you allergic to cedar? Like, are you different people have different reactions to different things, but broadly I call air thinking fuel. I call it sleeping fuel, all the same things that you know, to be true about a clean diet and with water and food, you need a clean air diet as well. So it's basically, it's a great way for you to get, you know, everything from critical being go hang out in a bucket of smoke and you won't be able to breathe at all. And there's, there's also a very optimal side of this spectrum where you could breathe amazing air. And like anyone who's, I recently dialed in my water quality for way too long. I, I, I neglected it, not just my drinking water, but my shower water, my bathing water, my pool water, the whole thing, my skin, my sleep, my energy. I'm shocked at the, and you know, we talk about microplastics. If you measure the air for microplastics anywhere, there is a ton. So basically everything I'm learning about water is almost identical to air. It's just a different form. Beautiful. Um, let's move over to, because one of the dangers that people get from a little bit of information is they take action thinking that they're remedying the situation. But in fact, they're just essentially remedying their anxiety about the situation not the situation that generated the the anxiety in the first place and there's a lot of that what i call um glossing over thinking going what i call i call it low resolution solutions for real problems and i see this everywhere like it's from patching the roads to electing a new government Bandage. Okay, Bandage. like it really is that deep. Like, you know, it's like maybe it's not the government is the actual problem. Maybe it is the the the, the underbelly of that that's the problem. Maybe it's not the, the 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 pavements problem. It was the engineering design that went into it that's creating the the problem. So right. it's very hard to think in depth of solutions, right. and oftentimes in the uh, spirit of trying to solve something we've used these band-aid like solutions and yes. i think air quality filtration which at the start of this story you talked about these industrialized filters and then you talked about these like cheap ineffective filters but both of them are essentially the attempt to solve the problem of bad air, whether that's from the way your house was built, whether it was from toxins in your inner house, whether it was from cooking, pollutants in the air, off all these assortment of air quality disruptors, which are almost impossible to account for for everyone simultaneously. So you're like, okay, what's the number one mitigation strategy? I better just I better just make the assumption that my air is bad. Let's start cleaning the air. To the best of my ability, what is an effective solution for that, for the individual that's reasonable, responsible, and will likely do a, a good to great job in dealing with this? Because there's size of filtration, there's quality of filtration. Every filtration company I've seen, and I've looked at this a lot, I'm confused. Yeah. Everybody tells me they got the best solution, and I don't know. I don't know what, what, what's the best solution. So what is the best solution? Yeah, it's it's a, a very big problem because it's very hard to educate and it's very hard for people to see it on a graph or on a chart because it's air is invisible. Right. I'm doing fine. What are you talking about? Air is lagging the water filtration. I would say it was about 20 years behind. And I'd say post COVID years, it's like 10 years behind. Everybody knows what PPE is now and... Uh, Things move through air and like the education is getting better. I, th I actually think so. I'll, I'll touch on some basic, simple solutions, because the last thing you want to do is make everything feel like, ah, yet another thing I need to be worried about. And not the stress of being worried about the air is going to be making you more sick than the air itself. Yeah, this is not the ideal outcome. So, like, for example, I have one of these on my desk. This is a high number. This is this. This is the CO2. Oh, cool. That's really neat. Typically want this to be around. What's that it. called? This is a product called Aeronet 4. Uh-huh. 
Uh, I think I saw Elon Musk using one and they're, they're, they're a couple hundred bucks. It's not the cheapest one, but the, the battery lasts four years and it doesn't measure VOCs and particulates. It just says CO2. Um, and it's amazing because I have, like, if I go into someone's house, I'll immediately go, your CO2 level is about 700, your mold situation is good, your particulates. I don't need most gadgets because I've calibrated my biosensors yep. that we got the sensors on board. Yeah, it's kind of like I, I can guess my weight within a half pound on any given day. Spike, you get a five, like five to eight pound variance. depending. Or if you on go outside, area. if three of us go outside and we guess the temperature. Right. You don't really need the weather thing to tell you if it's shady, sunny, crazy wind. You know, there's some variance there. But generally, you the number only means something because you've calibrated that number on the Google weather or weather network to a feeling. This, this is actually one of the principles we talk about in the Ultimate Nutrition Bible is like, OK, if you have a lack of awareness in something, you use biofeedback, whatever you're feeling, to correlate with the data. So yes. eventually you get so tuned into this, you can tell what something is just based on your biofeedback because you have a relatable scale in your mind. So that's essentially what you're doing, the same thing around air quality. Yeah, it's the exact same. So um, this room is not bad. It's pretty good. Uh, I was in a, one of those WeWork phone booths the other day and I was hitting 3,000. And so the least aware version would be none. They're just exhausted. They're suboptimal and they're... None the wiser. Next level up would be, it's stuffy. It's stuffy in here. That's the best word. It's stuffy. After this call, I need some fresh air. What's actually, the higher level is the CO2 level's high. And I know that because of that, that feeling of stuffy, a little difficult to breathe. Each breath is not as easy. You go outside, you're like, ah, that really is lighter, fresher. It's easier to breathe. So, like if I crack, I'll, I'll crack this door a little bit, get some air in. So because I've calibrated my biosensors for CO2, I don't really need this thing. I usually keep it to stay calibrated and to, to teach and make sure I'm, I want to stay calibrated. Same thing. I've tested the, the mold in a thousand ohms. If it smells a little musty or moldy or moldy, there's mold. If your water tastes a little chemically at that tap water, it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we're really good. Like temperature is the number one thing that we kind of are attuned to. If it's hot, I want it. It's hot, it's cold. You know, I hate that. We, we learn those five senses, at like first grades or we're Canadians, grade one uh, science class. And uh, it's like sight, touch, sound. You know, they talk about these senses. I don't like touch. So I switch touch to feel because touch is just like tactile finger stuff. But if you go in the desert or a dry sauna, you know you know what dry feels like. If you go into a steam room or a rainforest, you know what humid and damp feels like. Yeah, that's because you have a relative humidity sensor on board. If, you know, when we hear that the shark can smell the blood two miles away or the bear can smell the dead animal two miles away, you're like, how? It's not that it's smelling the animal two miles away. It's literally that air current and that water current. It is, tr it's, a little bit of that animal has off-gassed, it's aerosolized, and it's spread so wide that the bear has caught the whiff, the shark has caught the, the whiff, and it's able to smell upstream of that current, which is interesting because if you think about it, if we put a pile of garbage in the corner of the room and I blindfold you and I put your hands behind your back, you can find the garbage. You yeah. literally also can smell via air currents. It's this really three-dimensional, four-dimensional thing where you can locate the sense of the toxin with your nose because you literally have a bacteria sensor on board. You have, we have so much, we know, we know what like poop smells like. If you got a baby's bedroom and they got that little diaper genie and it stinks, it smells like poop. It's because it's poop. So you have to learn to just trust these things because when you start to get more aware of cooking odors aren't optimal, hard to breathe, not great. Chemically tasting water, not good, too hot, bad so we, we you know you you really get in touch with that and when you do you're able to just constantly kind of optimize crack the windows in the car i've had um i do this all the time i i drive i don't like to drive at the windows up in my car I drive with a little bit of window open i've always so, been that way because i just didn't feel right you're not right and i put i've put the co2 into cars before that sensor i've seen it hit 3500 
which is like evacuate the building levels. Why are you so exhausted in the winter on your road trip? You have no oxygen and you're inhaling carbon dioxide at a crazy rate. So yeah, crack in the window, or if you don't want to crack it, purge it every 20 minutes for a couple quick seconds. The fastest way to purge air in a car is either two windows or it's, it's the sunroof on slant mode with yep. one other window cracked. You'll purge it in like two seconds without giving off, without losing much heat or cool. Um, so like what, so now going back to like practical things someone could do. So yeah. first using a Kleenex or a tissue, make sure your bathroom fans and your range hood over the stove even work. That's a good thing you could do. If temperature permits, also like you can go on Google, you could type in air quality near me, air quality in the city. Almost every city measures air quality, they measure allergy levels. If it's a really bad air quality day, not the best day to go for a run. If it's a great air quality day, great day to go out for a run. If the air quality is great outside and the temperature is good, let's just really open up all of our windows today. So just like checking the data. If, um, you know, using a gadget like this to check your CO2 at night is a great idea. Like um, in my place in British Columbia, our CO2 was hitting 3,500 at night. We didn't have a centralized right. HVAC system. Right. We had baseboard heaters and um, heat pumps. Oh, so we wow. closed the door at night to keep the cats out. And because sleeping with animals has its own set of issues if you don't have high quality air filtration. And our CO2 is going from 700 to 3,500. You know, I, I was breathing heavy. Sometimes it would be smoky with the wildfires or, and, or cold. But leaving the bathroom on suite door open, bathroom fan on, kept it under 900. That wow. little ventilation was enough to keep it under control. Wow. I didn't spend any money. I didn't have to do any crazy fantasy ventilation systems, but that awareness told me, and the way air works is one CFM out equals one CFM in. So you don't need a fresh air intake. You need a little stale air to leave, and then the new fresh air will take its place. Um, so yeah, when there's cooking, Ventilation, either I mean the, the loud range hood on full is really unpleasant. So windows are much better for sure. Or if the range hood's on, even when you're done cooking, leave it on. You could turn the bathroom fans on. When you shower, the best thing is if you can get a timer on your um it's called the humidistat if it's a humidity sensor, but those little timers in the bathroom when you're done showering, if you could turn on that vent for two hours, it's much better than manual. Because if you think about all the moisture your towel can soak up. That's just dumping it back into your house. So if you can close that bathroom door after the shower, have it on for a couple hours, or even leave it on till the next morning. So while that water is evaporating, you're venting out of the house. That's an easy win. You can go to EWG or Think Dirty, two different websites where you can see how many, like, you know, branch, ba what a good time to be alive. There's actually good food products. There's actually, if you look for it, and there's actually good chemicals to, I mean, less chemical cleaning agents, water and vinegar, water and a soft soap, softer soaps, Dr. Bronner's for your hands. There's, there's a lot of like much better cleaning chemicals. Um, there's much less harmful hairsprays. There's a yeah. lot of things you can do. Humidifiers are inherently very bad. They, like you talked about the solution trade-off situation, humidifiers solve the problem of dry air. And then if, if someone has a Jasper and a humidifier, the Jasper is going to turn red and the particulate is going to go into the hundreds because you've aerosolized all that water. So unless you're using distilled water, the air quality is going to get better from a humidity standpoint and much worse from a because you've aerosolized all those chemicals, all those minerals that you don't necessarily want to be breathing. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of little things you can do. But let's talk about uh, your company, Jasper, the filtration. Sure the filtration that you're offering. Why did you develop the Jasper and what areas does it address and how do people use it? Good questions. So I tried first for the first two years, I actually tried to make a filter that goes connected to the furnace and does the whole home. And I tried everything on the market, IQ Air and AmeriCare and Lennox. I tried everything you could think of. And Telepure, there's tons of brands. I tried them all. And mostly they all sucked. And I tried to create a better one and I gave up after two years. It is possible. It can be done. But it's kind of band-aid-y because your furnace was engineered to heat and cool the air. That's why it's there. It's not designed for anything else. Could you live in your car? Yeah. 
It's not the optimal for it though. Rather have a tiny house, rather have a tent even. Like, uh, so the furnace, they've tried to take the HVAC is the lungs of your home. And they've now added a big filter to it. It's loud. And your baby's bedroom and your master bedroom, you're purifying that air as much as the crawl space in the storage room. So you can't focus your cleaning efforts. It's like you put your space heater in the room that's cold. You don't put it into the room that you don't need it. So it was, you couldn't focus its cleaning efforts. It was quite loud. And once again, odds with energy efficiency, because when you heat and cool, often there's already hot and cold spots in a house. But when you add a, a heavy layer of filtration to the HVAC system, like, I don't know about you, I don't want to install a set of filters in my lungs because I, I mean, I don't want to give up 30% of my breathing capacity for cleaner air. I'd prefer to do the filtration outside of my body. So when we put these big filters on, we're really, we're creating a pressure drop. We're creating a lot of resistance. So now the furnace, it's working overtime. It's harder to heat. It's harder to cool. There's more CO2 because we have less ventilation. And ideally a good HVAC system is running 10 to 20% of the time. You know, your furnace kicks on, it kicks off, it kicks on, it kicks off. So when it's off, it's off. So those air filters are doing nothing when it's in off mode. So it's a really nice idea to just elegantly have your HVAC system doing the filtration for your home. If you build a custom home from scratch and we do radiant and floor heating and ERVs and, and a whole a whole biohacked air quality system, which I love and I advocate for, it's not really too retrofitable unless you gut your entire home. Again, it's thousands. So after trying to solve this problem for a few years, I said, forget it. This is not the silver bullet. I want to do it. Could we sell it? Could we market it? Hell yeah. But it doesn't work the way we want it to. Let's not impede the HVAC system doing the one good thing it does, heating and cooling effectively. So I realized let's actually have a decentralized air cleaning system. So what's so cool about water, we could put a reverse osmosis system under our sink. You know, we could put a structured water or hydrogen water or Berkey's. There's many, you could have point of use water filtration because we can really control where we get drink. We can order a live water and glass. We can really, we have like one intake, our mouth. We pour the water into our mouth. It's controllable. We wash our hands at the sink. We shower in the bathtub or the shower. It's very, it comes in a pipe, one pipe. Or, you know, you have your fridge filter. You can get like a Jolie shower head to have less chlorine in your shower, which works great, by the way. I've been very impressed by that product. You can also put in a whole home system for water softener, for carbon, for UV, depending what your problem is. So it's very easy to, to have a whole home or a point of use water system. With air, we can't exactly just like put something on a window and that cleans all the air. So the best way to tackle air is a whole home air filtration system. And I didn't realize this until actually quite recently. I used to, I get, I'm, I don't know how to be salesy. I don't have it in me. So I would always tell people about the cheapest possible option and just get one, it's enough. I'm not doing that anymore. People are spending seven, eight, nine, ten 10 grand on their water filtration systems, maybe five, $600 a year for filters. I used to think that was a ripoff. I just got it all. It's not, it's game changing for me. Look how much money we spend in the year in bottled water and mm -hmm. food and gas for our car. So when I realized like water and air are the two laziest ways to be healthy, you just pay some money and you get it done. So I, I think of Jasper has a decentralized air cleaning system. So let's say if I put a Jasper in my bedroom, my bedroom is going to have about 95% cleaner air. And because it's large in size, it can do that silently. And because if I have an HVAC system, it might have, so the bedroom air is going to be 95% cleaner the whole house is going to be about 20% cleaner. But because of the way HVAC systems work, every room generally has a return and a supply. So just by putting a Jasper in one room, any of the air that moves into that room goes back into the furnace and distributes around the house, it's cleaning all the air a little bit. If we put another one in the next bedroom, that bedroom is now 95, 99% cleaner. And now the whole house is 40% cleaner. Then we go and put one in the living room near the kitchen as close to the kitchen living space as possible. Now that room is 80, 90% cleaner. Now the whole house is up to 60, 70%. So it's a very scalable system. Clean air in the bedroom is the top because if you can have dialed in air quality when you sleep, 
it's game changer. But then dealing with the cooking and the sleeping is the biggest deal. So, and each one is a has its own fan and its own filter. So it's additive to airflow. It's additive to circulation. When your furnace turns on and off, it's still filtering the air. So unlike water, where we just slap one box in the garage or in the crawl space or in the attic with air, we really need a decentralized system. So that's kind of how it works. Each one has a sensor on board. So when you start cooking or you start cleaning or those wildfire smoke, you'll see all of them pick up together, ramp up the fan speed together, and then very quickly bring the air quality back down to a, to a clear level. So we actually put, um, similar to the way this looks, we put an air quality display right on the units. So you can see the air quality in real time. So it actually acts to calibrate your sensors. If you're barbecuing, if you're cooking, if you're cleaning, if there's smoke, if there's pollution, you see the air quality, the red, yellow, green, the number, and you start to calibrate that particular sensor. Um, so that's my long kind of winded answer of how we think about it. Okay, so we're gonna be concise on a couple things. How many square feet roughly does a Jasper handle? <laughs> we can't talk in square feet. I used to, and I can't. Are you seven foot ceilings or 22 foot ceilings? Right. Cubic volume is really what matters. Okay. Is there a centralized HVAC system running or not? If there is, there's more added airflow. So really, if you have one big open thousand square foot, and then it's like, if I said a thousand square foot or a hundred square foot, it could help for a thousand square foot. But right. It's but not excellent air. In, okay. In so a, so correct me and get concise here before we. Uh, I, 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 I need yeah. help, actually. Uh, yeah. It's a very hard thing to to just make simple. So standardized ceilings in a 2,500 square foot home, three a bedroom eight. type thing, three to three, three type, three bedroom. Yeah. There's place. a furnace, HVAC yeah. system. How many Jaspers? Would, would you just put a Jasper in every room? Jasper in each bedroom and one in the common living area is the gold standard. Yeah. But if someone wanted to limp in the game, then I would tell them to put one in their bedroom. Lights off, fan speed two. The average bedroom, by the way, has about 800,000 particles in it when you measure the particulate. That's your insect parts and all those indoor outdoor pollutions we talked about. We can typically go from 800,000 to about 20,000. Got it. Um, so that's kind of per, one per bedroom and one for the main living room is the gold standard, but one is better than none. Got it. I see. Um, and then what? how much are Jaspers exactly? So as of very recently, so they were 1975 for the first two years of the business. When we launched during COVID, we only sold to doctors and dentists. Then we fully shifted away from businesses to get back to our roots and selling to families. We got it to $13.99. And as of January 2nd of 2024, it's $9.99 because everyone raised their prices during COVID. We talked about this before the pod and no one's put them back down. And guess what? Honestly, our shipping rates have normalized. The cost of steel is normalized. Our costs are reasonable again. So we, we're trying to bring prices back down to what they were and what they were supposed to be. So we're $9.99 now. And if people buy two, three, four, they get as low as 719. So we bundle them and it feels great. Where 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 can people find out more about Jasper, air quality, your business, all this sort of stuff? At Jasper dot at Jasper Co on Instagram, but our website, jaspr.co. And I, I do a lot more podcasts and they're all a little bit different. It's a very hard thing to learn in, in a little small bite size. But, you know, we, we have something that we call the life changing guarantee. So like our warranty is lifetime as long as people are changing the filter twice a year. So if someone in the first 60 days, our number one feedback that customers say that makes me so happy is I've had a million air purifiers before and I wasn't sure if they were doing anything. This is the first one where I, it was 100 percent obvious how much it does. That's why if someone goes to our Instagram and looks at the videos people tag us in where they see it during cooking and cleaning and they measure their auras and their whoop and all that, it's awesome. So if someone doesn't forget air quality testing, if you don't obviously feel way better than what we do, we send them a prepaid shipping label, you put it back on the box, you put the unit in, we take it back, we give you all your money back because I want customers that I can help for life. If it's not an absolute game changer for you, then you shouldn't invest in it. You should have your money back. So the bet, and if somebody buys one and then they're like, you know what? I want two, three, four, you email us and we will apply the four unit discount or the two unit discount as if you bought a bulk at the first time. So no incentive to buy more up front. If somebody could just put one, get one Jasper, try it in their kitchen, living room area on smart mode for a week, 
put it in their bedroom on fan speed too with the lights completely dark. There's no ambient lights at all. It's made out of steel. If it doesn't obviously improve the sleep, then I would say take it back and we're confident enough to, uh, to put our money where our mouth is. Mike Feldstein, that is some great information. The company is Jasper. We'll put all the links in the show notes for our audience. I want to thank you for sharing all this really insightful information on how important air quality is. You know, years ago, I upgraded my water tech, and uh, that was transformational for myself and literally tens of thousands of people in my sphere of influence. I believe that air is the, the next big game changer here in the world. You're doing good work in the world. Thank you for coming on the podcast. And for all our listeners, check out your air quality. Do some tests. Find out what's going on. You're not sleeping right? Not feeling right? Got allergies? Got pollen issues? Got off-gassing issues? Got animals? Mike has just illustrated that's things probably compromising your health. Probably con compensating in ways that you can't imagine. And your life just might change. In fact, they guarantee it. Check out Jasper. Thanks so much for joining us, Mike. And thank you, listeners, for listening to us. As always, if you like it, share it with someone you love. Give us a thumbs up. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Wayne T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion. And a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.